Everything in this video is not intended as financial or investment advice. It is for educational purposes only. I'm Josh Holswich, the head of research at Valkyrie. Let's take a look at the midweek market update. I'm going to start with on-chain analytics first here today. For those who are unfamiliar, because of the blockchain and the technology that it provides, we can look at anything that's ever happened uh, on most chains it are pretty transparent. Um, this varies from chain to chain, but ultimately you can see things like transactional activity, size of activity, addresses that are active or unactive, coins that have moved or not moved. Um, Bitcoin is the most transparent in that regard in that the metrics are there, have been there for many, many years. As you go down the road towards coins that have newly been released or coins that are in experimental phases, the data discovery on those coins is a bit more difficult and nuanced, and you need to individually sort of run your own node for the network to pull those values, which is where these values are being pulled from for Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, directly from having a node in the network. You can see all this stuff rather easily. So when we're looking at transactions per day, for example, you know, this is values that are propagated across the network. And in general, as you see more activity on a network across the board, doesn't matter which coin it is, which blockchain it is, you generally tend to see higher prices. And the inverse is, of course, true with declining activity on chain. You see declining prices typically. Now, occasionally there's a divergence there, meaning one is declining while another is rising. And we're kind of seeing that with uh, Bitcoin here. On chain activity, surprisingly, I was surprised to see this is, is rising week over week. Now you could say, you know, this is very, very volatile. Uh, this is just one metric, you know, tons of caveats for this. But ultimately, when I'm seeing price being held in a range, uh, what I definitely don't want to see is activity falling off the table. I definitely don't want to see everyone leaving with the last person shut the lights out sort of situation um, if I expect price to maintain that level. So as maybe bearish as I am near term price wise because of the technicals, the fundamentals, which are to me on chain activity are rising here week over week and have been for a few days now. Again, this isn't robust. This isn't like so divergent from price that it's going to perhaps make a massive difference, but it is interesting that we are seeing activity pick up here and we can look at active addresses as well. These are addresses that have changed in value over the previous day and just as you're seeing a rise in transactions, you're seeing a rise in active addresses. All of these metrics have caveats as far as what they are, what they do, what they measure, what they've measured differently now versus 2018 and 2017. Things have gotten less and less vanilla across the board with on-chain analytics. You're seeing more complex transactions now. You're seeing complexities in addresses. Uh, this drop-off here, for example, was miners from China leaving, and we're just now sort of recovering from that still. So it's a different situation than 2018 necessarily, where of course, partially this was minor related in that miners took a hit in profitability, but ultimately <laughs> you know, this is the masses, the euphoric masses coming and going uh, with price here. And we have not seen that uh, in this 2021 range. The addresses, the, act, the uh, transactions are basically holding within similar levels as they did before the price run up. And again, you're seeing this divergence here where price is declining and on-chain activity is picking up. This is total addresses ever on the network. Not a metric you maybe see too often, um, but gives you a very broad picture of where we were and where we are now as we approach a billion addresses on the network historically. These are addresses that have ever been created, as they say in, in glass notes here, that have ever appeared in a transaction on the network. One address does not equal one person. It could be miners, it could be several entities having thousands of addresses, right? Uh, but it does tell you that there appears to be no signs of slowing here. Uh, just looking at the slope of this line, for example, you know, when you're talking about the S-curve of adoption. So again, I'm hesitant to sound overly bearish on prices I'll get to in the back half of this. When I look at metrics like this, that definitely tell a different picture. Here's a number of new addresses. Again, we can we can tease this and look at this in all sorts of different ways. And again, you're seeing this slow rise in new addresses as price falls, which is interesting to me. 
perhaps it says that as price is falling, people are entering the market. Certainly what you want to see, you'd much rather see that uh, as, or at least I would, as prices are falling, people getting in versus people getting slaughtered sort of at this euphoric uh, price high as they did in 2017, 2018. But to me, the most important thing here is activity is not dropping off a table, certainly. Um, this is Lightning Network capacity. Lightning Network is a layer two bi-directional transaction network on top of Bitcoin where transactions are basically free, basically instant. You know, there's some caveats there, but the capacity measures, similar to like a debit card system, um, the amount of Bitcoin in that ecosystem versus on the main chain. So currently we are at all-time highs in Bitcoin in that ecosystem at 3,700 BTC, which on the grand scheme of things, as a percentage of total circulating supply, isn't incredibly significant considering there's 18 million uh, circulating coins, but notional, this is approaching levels of uh, significance, multiplying coins by price, obviously. And again, you're seeing this divergence where Litecoin network capacities continue to rise despite price falling or ranging here. Thus far, it tells me the on-chain activity is a bit agnostic to price and certainly hash rate, which keeps screaming higher, approaching another all-time high. Basically, week over week, it's a new all-time high with hash rate, and that should continue as we're getting more ASICs, more miners, more, more, more across the world, more renewables for mining. The only thing that's going to reverse this anytime soon is price declining, because then you price out the inefficient miners, whereas the miners paying, for example, five cents or less for electricity versus miners that are paying between five and 10 cents for electricity are going to be not profitable at levels let's say below 35K versus industrial miners who are profitable all the way down to maybe 15K, right? Or less. So that's that's where you're going to see this, this hash rate change. And it was similar in 2018. I'm going to do some comparisons uh, price-wise to 2018. You see hash rate all-time high, all-time high, all-time high. And then price drops, hash rate drops, right? That's just a profitability shift there. Um, even with the having, which is a block reward having, you don't really see that show up here. You know, you wouldn't know necessarily where that was. That was just a blip. Really the biggest, most significant shift in hash rate was during the mining exodus in China when China banned Bitcoin mining. Hash rate basically lost 50% kind of overnight in very short order. And that has shifted more towards the US now and mining efficiencies are taking off miners are scaling up and that's why you're seeing hash rate continue to rise here. Bitcoin balance on exchanges continues to fall. And again, there's a divergence here between coins on exchanges, free float, available supply for sale, however you want to think about this versus price. Uh, again, in 2018, you saw rising balances on exchanges. Now you're seeing falling balances on exchanges. So again, as bearish as I might sound price-wise in a second, the on-chain fundamentals are different. Um, there's a lot more institutional involvement here in many ways, which maybe makes this rosier than it could look uh, because this looks like an incredibly bullish viewpoint, whereas these coins are probably going towards more than just custody on an institutional level. You know, they're, I don't want to say rehypothecated, but it's, it's a different breed than it was in 2018, certainly on an institutional level. And so we're seeing different ways that these coins are being used off of centralized exchanges and those exchanges include uh, Binance, Bitfinex, Bit, Bitthumb, Bitmax, right? It's it's everything, including derivatives, including um, the non-American exchanges, right? Apollo, any, anything. Um, Glassnodes will pick this up. So it's not like it's a, it's a data issue necessarily. Um, this is very much real um, as we're seeing coins just leave in mass for other avenues. Something on a bit more technical level, uh, MVRV, which again, if we look at the market cap versus coins that are actually moving on the chain, and we take a look at some math equation, make a z-score out of it, and we try to see, does this tell us anything? Does market cap versus on-chain activity tell us anything about oversold, overbought conditions? Does it help illuminate the situation? Uh, and I think it does rather well. You can see anytime we've spiked in the seven plus zone for this metric, meaning market cap has exceeded on-chain activity at a multiple uh, significant on the z-score here, then we have seen essentially all-time highs in price. And the opposite is certainly true. Anytime on-chain activity 
overtakes market cap, then that has typically been a price bottom. You'll notice that we typically spike into overbought conditions and kind of drift through oversold conditions. And as we sit here now, we're not really we're not really there yet as far as oversold goes. Um, the only spike in the oversold territory we had was during COVID, March 2020, that initial candle there on that day. But when I'm looking for high time frame, high conviction indicators, this is certainly one of them that talks to on-chain activity and says, are we overheated or are we too oversold, right? So this is definitely something to look for and watch towards the rest of the year. Real quick for ETH, basically more of the same, um, slightly rising on-chain activity for transactions here, transactions still maintaining levels of 2018, right? This is a different network now. There's DeFi, there's NFTs, there's all sorts of stuff going on that keeps transactions high, that will keep active addresses high, regardless of fees, regardless of the network kind of crippling itself with fees, fees approaching 500 plus dollars per transaction. When you see these NFT mints happen, you know, active addresses are still holding rather strong. A uh, number of addresses on this network continue to increase much like Bitcoin and doesn't really show any signs of slowing. This is new addresses now. And, you know, this doesn't look as bullish maybe as the Bitcoin version, but you're not seeing this go to zero. You're still seeing plenty of activity here despite the lack of euphoria, right, in price. You can clearly see this was ICO craze type activity in 2017, 2018, how that came and went very, very quickly. What's that saying about a candle that burns twice as bright, lasts half as long, right? Uh, so we had all these new entrants come in right at the top, as typically happens, and they were all essentially washed away in short order. Uh, but again, we're maintaining, even on ETH, this level of on-chain activity. Uh, and ETH's hash rate, interestingly enough, continues to increase. This is an all-time high on a weekly basis. Let's see if it's an all-time high. Yeah, it's an all-time high, all period, end of story, on a daily basis, which is interesting because ETH is switching to proof of stake, most likely, uh, by the end of the year. We'll see if that actually happens as far as um, the devs historically have been unable to sort of deliver on time. Um, but we'll see if it happens. Nevertheless, all of this mining activity is going to have to go somewhere else because they won't be able to mine on Ethereum. And for Ethereum specifically, the algorithm is called et hash. Uh, for Bitcoin, it's SHA-256. Bitcoin uses ASICs mainly for mining which are application-specific integrated circuits. Ethereum uses mainly GPUs, which is why the GPU market has been insane. Look at any prices of uh, NVIDIA, AMD, anything lately. That's cooling off slightly as this shifts towards proof of stake, but it means that the hash rate on Ethereum is a bit more flexible than ASICs because it is GPU-based. So you're going to see this hash rate go somewhere else, um, most likely to coins that have the same algorithm, but not necessarily. It, it's much easier to mine with a GPU. It's more forgiving. You know, it's not specific to one algorithm. So this hash rate at the end of the day could go in multiple places. ETH's balance on exchanges as well continues to decline. You know, I say if coins have a job to do other than being sold, they go elsewhere. And that's what you're seeing, right? You're seeing DeFi NFTs just sort of take over. Again, comparing it to ICO boom bust, you saw ICOs take over balances on exchanges just drop like a rock. And as the ICO boom collapsed, you saw all that ETH come back to exchanges. So again, there's a divergence here between price and balances on exchanges, at least centralized exchanges, as ETH continues to go elsewhere. Uh, and then lastly for ETH on the on-chain stuff, the total value staked. So even though proof of stake is not live on the network, you can stake your ETH on what's called the beacon chain. And currently that's 12 million ETH out of the circulating supply that are sitting and staking. And again, you're seeing this divergence between price declining and supply getting soaked somewhere else. Eventually, you would think that this would probably have an effect on price. We haven't seen that just yet, but it's definitely something to watch for. So let's talk about technicals here. We are still, still connected at the hip to, to TradFi, S&P, NASDAQ, right? This correlation is probably the strongest it's ever been at this point. Uh, look at the 30-day rolling, 60-day rolling, 180-day rolling, 365-day rolling. Until we bust out of that correlation, until we break that correlation, 
um, you know, there's not kind of not much else to pay attention to. It's, it's hard not to pay attention to the NASDAQ when we're trading like the NASDAQ, right? So we sort of go wild at US open at US close pre post hours, right? You see all these correlations. We have FOMC today. That's going to likely create some intraday volatility as well. So legacy traditional markets definitely impacting uh, crypto here. If we look at, this is just Bitcoin on a weekly basis. If we look at the VIX, this is DXY, this is gold, this is the 10 year, this is S&P, NASDAQ, Nikkei. Uh, you can see that the correlations are quite interesting here. This is These are all 30 day rolling correlations. And first I'll mention the VIX. If the VIX is rising, we're generally more bearish on a technical basis. The inverse correlations are extremely strong with the VIX and crypto dating back to inception. Uh, that really has never broken. Um, so seeing the VIX rise immediately for me changes my expectations slightly. We're also losing correlation to the Dixie. We're, you know, we're growing on the inverse correlation to the DXY, growing on the inverse correlation to gold in the 10 year. And again, those correlations with SPX, NASDAQ, and Nikkei, you know, risk on type stuff are holding strong or rising. So it's certainly important to watch those markets in the near term and what affects those markets in the near term. And just looking at the DXY, not even commenting on the instrument itself, just from a technical basis, this is a impressive and impressive parabolic rise. Uh, probably one of the strongest weeks in the DXY, at least since the COVID stuff. We are now at a two decade high for the DXY. RSI is certainly leaning more and more towards that overbought territory. Uh, but you can see we can stay that way for quite some time. I think one misconception of overbought, oversold with people is that you could just cruise in these levels for a significant period of time. I mean, this was what almost a year in, in overbought territory and it still went higher, right? So this is a great example of a bearish divergence. Just again, not commenting on the instrument itself, but on the technicals of it. So we're certainly not seeing a bearish divergence here from this was the COVID stuff in March, 2020. Then they turned on the printer and down the D DXY went, but uh, it's important to watch this in the near term because eventually any price structure that looks like this on any instrument, crypto or otherwise, will cool off most likely, you know, regardless of fundamental factors, which are certainly pushing this, this higher, but it's definitely something to watch in the near term. If we look at the Bitcoin trend since 2019, pick three points, you get a rate of change. This is called a pitchfork and it's held within this pitchfork. Again, not too much to comment on week over week here. It's still surviving just as we were in the overbought territory in early 2021. We may cruise in this oversold territory based on this rate of change. So I'm not, I'm not panicked yet. And certainly we are uh, within the 2021 price range. So again, as, as bearish as this looks near term, zooming out, it's really not a massive outlier just yet. Um, what concerns me in the near term is this low volatility uh, environment below key moving averages. So if we zoom way out again, historically look all the way back to 2012, we use these metrics called Bollinger Bands. You can see we are consolidating below the 20 week moving average as volatility is contracting, which is what this is measuring here. This is Bollinger Band width. So I'm just measuring the, the width of the Bollinger Bands, which are two standard deviations from the 20 week moving average. So as volatility contracts with price below that 20 week MA, the only time that's ever happened is 2018, really. I mean, you can argue 2015, um, this was a year plus of, of sideways consolidation that maps out to white coffee and accumulation. We certainly don't map out to white coffee and accumulation here for those of you who know what that is, but um, this is much different and more closely resembles 2018 a little bit. You know, 2018 was different and I'll go through that and what sort of helped tip the apple cart there. But looking at this just in a vacuum, my immediate reaction is until we are above that 20 week MA, the expectation is bearish continuation here. That 20 week MA is at 4,200, sorry, 42,000. And the more weeks we consolidate below the 20 week MA, the higher the likelihood we eventually get a breakdown. 2018 was six weeks. We're currently on week three. So we really need to get moving in the other direction unless we want to test uh, some lower levels here. Uh, something else to look at on a zoomed out scale is the 200 week MA, which is the green here, as well as the two year MA with that multiplier on the two year 
for me, I'm constantly evaluating, are we overbought? Are we oversold? Are we ranging? Are we trending? So similar to the MVRV, which is just looking at on-chain activity versus price, this is just looking at price and looking at those moving averages, but it tells you the same story in that it gives you these overbought, oversold conditions. Currently, we are pr approaching oversold based on that two-year MA. You can see how this has looked in that zone. It's taken a while, right? It's just like the MVRV stuff. Typically, this is a six-month to a year process of sitting in this zone. We've also typically, not guaranteed in the future, we've bottomed out at the 200-week MA, which in this case is the 1,400 MA on the daily. That's sitting at around 22. So this is very much an if this then that situation. If we can continue to consolidate below the 20 week moving average, my expectation raises for a bearish breakdown. If we see a bearish breakdown, we probably make an eventual attempt to this 200 week moving average, which will slowly move up over time. So these are all things uh, that I'm personally watching for because in the near term, this is a lot of garbly gook, right? There's, <laughs> there's nothing going on here. Um, as far as directionality is concerned that I can tell, you know, we're certainly again, below these MAs, the 50, the 200 on the daily volume is flat. RSI is essentially flat. Momentum is flat here. We had this ascending triangle set up. That was a failed breakout. We were above the 200 for a brief period of time. You know, things looked okay. And we've since lost all of that. So my conviction in the near term on anything isn't really too high one way or the other. Uh, just to rewind the clock a little bit to 2018, when we had that breakdown, we were below the 200 day moving average for months at that point. We were below the 50 day moving average for a month or more at that point. Tether basically exploded, uh, which certainly as the predominant stablecoin at the time shook confidence in the market. By exploded, I mean the reserves were put into question as far as if they actually had reserves. <laughs> so since this time, Tether has cleaned up their act considerably, thanks in large part to USDC, which was brought into existence because of Tether's lack of transparency. But a rising tide raises all boats in that regard. So Tether on the exchange rate dropped to 85 cents briefly. And you saw a spike in uh, crypto prices as people were exiting Tether into Bitcoin, for example. Weeks went on and then we had a legacy collapsing. We had uh, a hard fork in a, in a side chain, not a side chain, a hard fork of a hard fork of Bitcoin. We had miners selling coin, right? We had all these events that eventually impacted price. On top of all that, we had this bearish descending triangle, right? Different price structure than currently. Um, but this is what it took to bring us from 6K to 3K. Volume picked up immediately. And eventually we had this bearish divergence in momentum where price went lower on less momentum. Price was also below that oversold level significantly. So this for me is about formulating a plan of action should this happen again, right? Not saying it will happen, but this is what to look for. You're looking for catalysts. You're looking for volume, which is basically fear. I mean, this is capitulation as you're seeing momentum diverge here. So these are the things to watch for should we break down in a big way, right? And this was the 200 week moving average down here. What's interesting now is, you know, the mining wallets specifically as we tease apart the catalysts, mining wallets are holding slightly more Bitcoin than they were pre-2018 breakdown. Miner wallets at that time were holding 1.8 million. They're currently holding 1.82 million. The difference now and then is that miners have a lot of ways to not sell their crypto and still hold on to it. So this, this value is may be deceiving. It's certainly concerning that they're holding as much as they were then, because as price starts to drift lower, you typically see people selling, you know, they're selling lows instead of selling into strength. So it's certainly something to watch for. Um, and if we're talking about legacy specifically, legacy dove 23% from highs in that period where crypto went from 6k to 3k. And currently we're all, we're already down 24% from the highs on NASDAQ. So Again, as bearish as I might be, I kind of have to weigh this out and think, okay, you know, does the NASDAQ or do all these catalysts potentially have another run in them to the downside? You, know, you might think, yes, you might think this has a ways to go to the downside. But if we're comparing apples to apples, it's already down <laughs> as much as it was in, in 2018. And you can see the resilience basically we've had in, in Bitcoin thus far, even with those correlations holding as high as they have. 
Something else to watch for is Bitcoin dominance. This is market cap of Bitcoin versus the world versus um, anything else in crypto. And in 2018, you saw this flee to, to BTC out of alts, out of coins that weren't Bitcoin. And typically they call this altcoin season when alts do really well. Again, this was ICO mania. ICO mania cooled off and money flowed back into Bitcoin relative to alts. And this has lined up fairly well with a 200 day moving average on, on dominance. And currently we are, we're teasing a breakout above the 200 day moving average. So this is something else to watch for. Should things get bearish, alts typically have more downside than, than Bitcoin because people flee from Bitcoin or from alts to Bitcoin or to stable coins. But in any case, Bitcoin dominance typically strengthens in that period. Looking at ETH quickly here, I don't have too much to say about ETH. It's really more of the same. It's kind of sideways in a range. It's It needs a catalyst for one way or the other, just like Bitcoin. I think ETH's catalyst is going to be that merge, that proof of stake shift. As far as lows on ETH, you know, if things get bearish, I like a test of 1800 just based on the triple bottom in uh, May, June, July, based on the volume down there. Uh, but we would need, I think, significant bearish price action for ETH to sort of crush down below the 1800 level, right? You know, it has, it has a ways to go to even get there. So I think if things do flip bearish, it's definitely going to at least acknowledge that area and take a pause. ETH against Bitcoin also sideways ranging, but as far as chart patterns go, this does have an ascending triangle in the works with higher lows repeatedly, you know, really since, since 2021. Uh, so again, if you're looking for a catalyst, I like the merge as a catalyst for this to actually move higher and to test that 0.1 uh, level. But this is going to be excruciatingly long process, most likely um, into that, maybe the end of the year, right? This thing looks like it's going nowhere fast, but at the same time, it does lean uh, more and more bullish every time it makes a higher low. As far as DeFi is concerned, just on prices on this index, which is an FTX index of market cap weighted DeFi coins like Uniswap, currently below the 200, below the range, below the VPVR support, just sort of kind of free floating here. Doesn't have a chart pattern that I can necessarily discern or any sort of divergence here. So DeFi may be in for a bit of a bumpy ride in the next few months if things uh, do flip bearish. And just to flip through some individual coins here, uh, BNB looks very much like ETH, very similar as far as downside is concerned with uh, supports at this level. You know, this is just sideways ranging, just like ETH, uh, not really too much to comment on there. Uh, Solana, big thing that I'm, I'm seeing with Solana is just this drop off in volume. This is just on Binance, but again, you, you can't see this drop off in activity on chain or volume and expect a miracle, right? Uh, if we look at 2022, sorry, 2021 mid year and how that volume switch sort of turned on, it's certainly harder to be bullish on anything when, when the volume is declining month over month, like it has on Solana here. There's also a potential inverted cup and handle chart pattern, which is definitely uh, bearish. So if this does break down again, you know, I like 40, 40 to 50 based on uh, the previous level. Some of these levels are, are brutal for, for drawdowns as a percentage, but that's where support is for a lot of this stuff. Uh, Luna continues to draw this rising wedge, which should eventually break down most likely. You know, I don't want to sound overly bearish on everything, but just based on technicals, this is a tough buy when you're seeing, again, volume basically go to zero with rising prices. That's a bearish divergence on top of this rising wedge. So that doesn't look like it holds shades of strong bullish continuation. ADA is already well on its way with declining volume for lower lows. This is definitely in what you'd call a bearish trend at this point. And again, this volume difference is just extremely stark for a lot of assets right now. This is Binance specifically, but it's night and day, you know. Uh, Doge as well, volume essentially zero on, on Binance. This is Poloniex, sorry. Um, and, you know, I like Doge to five if if lows are in the cards and then eventually back down here to this previous zo zone dependent on how those lows hold at five cents, you know. Uh, but right now, as we sit for most of this stuff, it's below key trend metrics like the 200-day moving average. Uh, DOT, kind of more similar to a blend of uh, BNB and ADA and ETH, still within the 2021 range, certainly trending down volume again 
just completely down on this is Kraken specifically. And you're not seeing a lot of activity here price-wise, uh, trading-wise for these exchanges. Lastly, AVAX, this is Binance as well. Alone, volume, essentially flat. Trend holding decently okay. You know, you are getting a death cross here on the 15 to 200 on the daily. It did reverse rather quickly from basically 100 to 60. You know, it's off 40%, let's say, from April to May. But ultimately, even this is holding within uh, its previous range from late 2021. So I know this was a long one. What'd you like? What'd I miss? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff, and happy trading.